Look, what do you call a group of lying, cheating, greedy, covetous, lustful, porn watching, tax dodging, racist, jealous, judgmental, lonely, selfish, angry people who eat too much, medicate too much, worry too much, spend too much, drink too much, smoke too much, complain too much, who gather together because they believe Jesus is the light of the world and they need more light. You call that the church. <laughs> Did I miss anybody? So if you showed up today uh, and you were worried that you were going to be surrounded by a bunch of uh, super holy, perfect people, I really hope that we burst your bubble. <laughs> if you were watching today or listening later on <laughs> today, you were thinking, I don't really fit in with that whole church crowd. Maybe you just found yourself on that list. It is still odd to me to hear people talk about the church like it's an institution rather than a group of people. And people say this, and maybe you have said this, you know, the church, the church ought to do this, right? Or the, the church, they ought to do that. Why doesn't the church do that? Um, the, the best one might be, you know what? The church should take a stand, right? Jonathan Reckford, he said, generally when people um, come to you and they say that uh, they want you to take a stand, what they really want you is to take their stand. So when people come and they say, I, I think the church should take a stand, I think what I'm going to say going forward is, any stand? Or, or your stand? And, and then that people might realize that what they really need, no, 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 no. I don't want you to take a stand. I want you to take my stand. I want you to agree with me. And if you're not going to agree with me, if you're not going to take my stand, well then I'd be just as happy with you not taking a stand. Why? Well, why wouldn't you take a stand? Why wouldn't you take my stand? Why wouldn't you agree with me? Because my stand is right. And really what people mean when they ask it, and they ask it of me, they say, I want you to take a stand, right? That was the implication, but I think most of you know this already. I'm not the church. Right? We are the church. And the church isn't a place where everybody agrees on everything. The church is a gathering of diverse people. The church is a gathering of imperfect people, which is why you're welcome here. Because you're imperfect, just like me. That's why you weren't offended by my little list. That's why you're able to find yourself on the list. And if you didn't find yourself on the list, there is very likely someone sitting near to you or close to you who can point out to you where you do fit on that list. The church is a gathering of imperfect people with different views and experiences. We don't agree on everything. We really only agree on two things. We agree that God sent his son into the world to forgive us of our sins, to help us get beyond ourselves, to forgive our sins and then to help us get over ourselves. Secondly, the thing that we agree on is that God sent his son into the world and when he did that, he extended something to us that we are responsible for extending to one another and to others outside of this gathering. That thing that we have been called to extend to others, well, that's what we've been talking about this whole series. And it's simply grace. Grace when it comes to relationships, grace when it comes to us. It's like the oil in the machine. Even I know enough about machines to know that how they work and that oil is important. The different parts of the engine of your car. They were designed specifically to work together. But they are designed so specifically, designed to work together, that without oil, they create friction and they will destroy each other. Grace is like the oil in a relationship. Grace is like the oil in a local church. Now, I think many of you, most of you have heard of Peter, passionate Peter, 
strong-willed Peter, bold and willing to take a risk Peter, good friend of Jesus Peter. And he wrote about this idea. He wrote about it using the language of love. So imagine if we are uh, well-oiled on a regular basis. And then imagine that something happens between us. Neither one of us might have been prepared for it specifically, but we were prepared for it anyway. This is the way uh, Peter wrote about it. He said, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Grace is like the oil in society. Grace enables folks who are different from each other to work together without destroying each other. Grace allows people who aren't like each other to like each other. Grace allows people who aren't alike to get along in such a way that they are able to accomplish absolutely amazing things, even though they have significant differences. The reason that we talk about this at Christmas is that your Heavenly Father <coughs> initiated this. Your Heavenly Father modeled this. And this is such a big deal. One of the most famous lines from one of the most famous Christmas carols that you just sang about grace. God and sinner reconciled. This line is placed in the mouth of the angel who was sent out to declare the good news to the shepherds. Listen! Hark! The herald angel sings. God and sinners reconciled. At Christmas we celebrate the reconciliation of God and sinners. And that could not happen without grace. You can be right without grace. But you can't be reconciled without grace. And aren't you glad? I am, just speaking for me, but aren't you glad that when Jesus didn't come into the world to be right? Jesus came into the world to make things right. And in the context of a relationship, grace becomes amazing when it's extended to others. Grace is invisible. It's not even a thing until it's experienced. And it's only experienced within the context of a relationship. When God sent his son into the world, he extended grace to us by sending Jesus to us. You are most amazing when you extend grace to other people. You are most like your Father in heaven when you extend grace to other people. God's amazing grace to you is an invitation to be amazing. The opportunity to extend grace to other people is our greatest relational opportunity, and it is to be amazing. But extending grace to other people is not easy for some of us. More specifically, extending grace to certain people is not easy for some people. And if I cry just a little bit, extending grace to certain kinds of people, certain groups of people, people who embrace certain behaviors, Groups of people who remind you of certain people who hurt you in the past. All of us have a person or a group of people to whom it is very hard to extend grace. And Jesus tells us why. Jesus asks us a very unsettling question. Jesus lets us know why it's difficult, why it's unsettling to extend grace. I should warn you though, this question is not going to make you feel good. You're going to want to dodge this question, and so before you get all set to dodge, I'm just going to throw it at you. Here's the question. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You think, well, Jesus, why don't you go back to talking about prayer, right? Something, something helpful like that. Well, just back off a little bit, Jesus. So remember that this is Jesus who's asking this question this morning and not me. I remind you of that just in case you get a little bit upset with how this goes forward. Why do you focus? Why do you look specifically at it? Why do you give all that attention? Why do you get so ramped up emotionally about this, this speck 
this, this little itty bitty thing that they do wrong. And as you do that, you don't pay any attention to your issues, to your problems, to your habits, to your attitudes, to the plan in your own eye. To which somebody says, well, preacher, I'll tell you why. Here's my answer. Answer number one, because it's not a speck of sawdust, all right? Okay? She's a liberal, right? He's a conservative. That's not a speck of sawdust. It's a whole forest in there. So don't get all upset with me and my response to him or to her. For some of us, it's more personal than that. It's not a speck. My dad left when, when we were eight years old, and he never looked back. He left my mom to raise three kids with none of his help. Then, when he got old and he got sick, he shows up and he wants us to help out. Well, I'm sorry, right? That's not a speck of sawdust. That's not a speck. I don't know what that is, but it's not a speck. These people, what they do, it's not a speck. It's exactly right. What kind of a question was that? What is Jesus getting all up in my grill like that for? Why would Jesus ask us stuff like that when he doesn't even know our story? Secondly, I don't have a plank in my eye. All right? First of all, that's not a speck of size. And secondly, the reason I pay attention to what's in my brother's eye and I pay no attention to the plank in my own is because I don't have a plank in my eye, all right? I see the world the way it really is. I understand how things really work. I know what's going on, right? You are not influenced in any way by your upbringing. There's no way that the environment that you were in, that you grew up in, has shaped your view. Your experience, can I get the list? Thanks. Uh, has shaped your view. Your experience hasn't impacted your view of the world, has it? And neither has your health or your lack of health. We all know that success never changes your ability to see the world, right? Your failures, your insecurities, your opportunities, your IQ or your EQ, None of them make any difference. Isn't that right? And some of you don't know what your EQ is because of your IQ. But these things don't influence the way that you see the world. Do they? Jesus must not be talking to you, right? Because you don't have a blank in your eye. Other people, oh, other people have blanks in their eyes. That's obviously who Jesus is talking about. He must have just been a little confused and not making that language clear. You and I, we're fine, right? But Jesus continues, and he says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. How can you say to your brother-in-law? How can you say to your neighbor? How do you say to the guy at work, or the woman who's down the hall, your boss, that person who used to be your friend, the one that ran off and took stuff, took him, took her. How can, how can you say to that person, let me take the speck out of your eye. Let me help you to see clearly. Let me help you to see the way the world really is. Let me tell you what you ought to do. Let me tell you what you should have done so that you wouldn't be where you are today. Let me explain it all to you, because I see the world as it really is. And all the time, Jesus says, flip, all the time, there's a plank in your own eye. When all the time you've been praying, the whole time, the whole time you've had such a bad attitude, the whole time, you're always looking at your watch, right? Every time you visit them, Checking your watch to see when you can go. Why, when the whole time you've had a plank in your own eye? And this is my, this might be your favorite part, especially if you're, you're not a Christian or you're trying to figure out where you stand with this, because Jesus just throws in a zinger right after that. Next thing is, you hypocrite. 
to which all the unchurched people are saying, finally, right? Someone give it to those church people. Who was that again? What, Jesus said that? He called his own folks hypocrites? You know what, I've been saying that for years. It's about time that somebody caught up to me. It's nice to see that it's Jesus. You hypocrite. You sinner. You fall shorter. That's what sinner means. You did it on purpose or over and over. Do you know why God is able to extend grace to you in spite of you? Do you know why God is willing to give you what you don't deserve, even though he knows better than anybody what you've done? Do you know why God doesn't overlook sin but chooses to forgive your sin and treat you as if you had never sinned? Do you know why God is able to extend grace? Do you know why God decided to send his son into the world to pay for your sins so that you could be reconciled through grace? Because he saw you exactly for who you are and he took all of that into consideration. He knows about you and your upbringing. He knows about your dad. He knows about your stepmom. He knows about that environment that you were forced into or the environment that you were taken out of. He knows about the environment that you can't get free from now. He knows you need friends. Everybody needs friends. Nobody can survive without friends. He sees all that. He gets all that. He knows what you've experienced. He knows what you've done. He knows what was done to you. He understands your health challenges and how that set you back. It was more difficult for you to connect. It was more difficult for you to excel. It was just more difficult for you. He understands what success has done for you and done to you. He blindsided you. Most people have a really difficult time passing the success test. He understands what failure did to you. What failure is doing to you right now. He understands the connection between what you were told as a child and your failure as an adult. He knows your insecurities. He knows the opportunities that you missed. He knows the opportunities that you took advantage of and the ones that you shouldn't have taken advantage of. Where that led. He knows about your IQ and your EQ. He took all of that into consideration. And the Apostle Paul, looking back on the crucifixion, looking back on the resurrection of Jesus, the Apostle Paul understood himself to be the biggest hypocrite of all, even though he knew the law as well as anyone else did in the first century. And Paul wrote this. But he didn't have us in mind when he wrote this. He had himself and his first century brothers and sisters in mind when he made this incredible statement. But God, this is another one of those big buts of the Bible. These incredible switches in history. It was, it was all like this. And it was going this way. But God. And these are some of my favorite places to connect with, to read and reflect in Scripture. This meant so much to the Apostle Paul. But God puts on a demonstration, right? God didn't just say it. God didn't just send it in a letter. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we... We're still sinners. Christ died for us. And, and I know that you love grammar, right? So let me just drop a little grammar here right now. The verb tense of this is so important. The Apostle Paul recognized when he was writing this letter. This, this is cool. Paul recognizes, while I was north of Jerusalem, unaware of what was happening in Jerusalem, while I was north of Jerusalem, sinning, Jesus was at that very moment that I was a sinner sinning. Jesus was dying for the sin that I was sinning. Think about that. 
This wasn't future tense. This was the Apostle Paul realizing, because they lived at the same time, right? While I was still a sinner, actively sinning, Jesus was nailed to a cross for the sins that I was in the process of committing at that very moment. He understood grace in a way that I don't think many of us will ever understand. Because he lived in the day and age, and it made sense to him in that day. So imagine that. While I was still sinning, Christ died for the sinner. And I think that if he had written his statement more with us in mind, with the future in mind, I think that he might have written it this way. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. Knowing ahead of time, the sins we would commit and confess and repeat and confess again. Christ died for us anyway. But that's what Christ does. That God was able to take your whole story into account and gave you what you deserved least, but what you needed most. And then he says to you, come on, I just want you to do for others what I've already done for you. But to be clear, don't leave and just feel bad about yourself, okay? Don't just uh, find someone to tell you, you know what? I'm going to be a better person. That's what we're going to do this year. 2020, I'm going to try and be nicer. My stepfather's coming home for Christmas, and I am not going to cross my arms once. I won't do it. I'm not going to be rude to him. This is not about go home and try to be a nicer person. Try to be a better person. Jesus says, no, that's not what this is about. That's not where this starts. This doesn't start by recommitting yourself to be sweeter and kinder. He said, first, first, before you try and figure out how to extend grace to someone else. You will never get that right until you first take the plank out of your own eye. And then, and only then, will you see clearly enough to know how to extend grace to the people that need it. They need what they don't deserve, but you can call to extend it to them anyway. This really is so powerful. You will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And this is such a difficult question, and the implications for us are unsettling and frankly bothersome. I want to stop thinking about the planks that I'm carrying around. What are the planks that I'm carrying around? Well, there's some people that I have a hard time with. And what, what, it is, what is it about them that actually reflects back on me? I don't want something to reflect back on me. I don't want it to be about me. Planks get in the way of grace. So here's an alternate version of Jesus' question. This is a better question. This one is shorter and certainly much more culturally dated. All right? Got planks? Have you got planks? I don't, I don't know if you've got planks, but Jesus says you've probably got planks. So why is there something that you're not looking for? Jesus is, is saying uh, that, that you begin to see first that person, you know, the way that I see that person. And then you will not dread the encounter as you will see the Encounter as an opportunity. And like we've said around here regularly for years, interruptions are opportunities. That's why we're going to see them. These potentially unpleasant interactions are opportunities to do something unexpected and unsettling so that you won't dread that occasion, that dinner, that party, that meeting, that gift exchange. You won't dread it as much as you're going to learn to say, aha, I know in advance, here is an opportunity to do something amazing. Here's an opportunity to do something unexpected. An opportunity to do something truly unsettling. Here's the one opportunity that I might very well have 
all year to do for someone what they would not do for me because of what they did to me. Something that they are not expecting me to do for them. And Jesus said, first, 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 you've got to examine your own heart. You've got to examine your own eye. First, you need to remove the plank from your own eye before you try to extend grace. If you just try to be nicer, if you just try to be more patient, if you just try to be more kind, and you don't deal with your own planks, it's just not going to work. You'll be frustrated and angry. First, remove the plank from your own eye and pay attention to the terminology. Then you will be able to see clearly. Then you will know. Then you will have greater insight. Then you'll be more authentic when you go to do for someone else what God has done for you through Christ. Let me share with you what I've learned the hard way. The more aware I am of what God has yet to do in me. In other words, the more time I spend in the mirror of God's Word, the more time I spend reading the message, uh, the teachings, learning about the activities of Jesus, the more aware I am of what God has yet to do in me. The more time I spend on my things, the less aware I am of what He has yet to do in you. The more I am aware of what, what is yet to do in me, the less aware. But honestly, it's, it's not just less, less aware, right? To be less bothered, less, less put off, the less offended I will be. The more aware that you are of what God is yet to do in you, the more aware you are of the plans that you need to remove, the easier it will be to extend grace to others. The less aware of, of uh, you are that you become of what God is going to do in them because you have your attention focused in another place on what God is going to do in you. You kind of see why this makes sense at Christmas? Why that makes this story so amazing? At Christmas, grace came to earth to dwell with us in spite of us, God with us, Emmanuel. At this Christmas, you are going to have the opportunity perhaps to do something in spite of And it won't be effective. And it won't work. And you'll find no joy in it unless you first remove the plank from your own eye. Isn't this interesting? That God was more brokenhearted over our sin than he was put off by it. He was more brokenhearted by our sin than he was offended by it. He was so brokenhearted over our sin that he sent his son into the world to pay for our sins so that God and sinner could be reconciled. Jesus drew near even though we, by choice, had been far away. Jesus didn't take sides. Jesus came alongside. Isn't that amazing? That's what we find throughout the Gospels. But there is an exception. There was a group of people that Jesus did not come alongside of. The Gospels reveal kind of a run and gun battle. The group of people that Jesus had the most conflict with, well, they weren't sinners in the traditional sense of sinners. The people that Jesus had the most problem with were the people who represented Graceless religion. <laughs> Religious people whose plants made it impossible for them to see the way that he saw. It. People who had so dumbed down God's law that they didn't believe that they were in any need of God's grace. People had so twisted and manipulated the law of God that they felt they didn't require the grace of God. And Jesus had no patience for them. No patience for that group of people. And I don't want to be one of those people. And I don't think that you want to be one of those people. And if you're not a person who is a church person, you're not a person who follows Jesus, then it may be 
because you ran into too many religious people who embraced passionately graceless religion. Because the truth is, when grace is up front, there's something very attractive about grace. And I bet that most of your favorite people in the world wear their grace. They carry their grace right up front. And Jesus said that, John said that Jesus was full of grace and truth. So I'm going to ask you another question. Even though it's going to feel like one more pesky, intrusive question, I feel like we can't, we can't end without this. Jesus was full of grace and truth. What are you full of? What comes out of you when you get shaken up? When you, when you bump into other sinners like you that have a different list of sins than you? When you bump into people who kind of get on your nerves, odds are pretty good that you get on their nerves as well. What comes out of you when you're bumped? What comes out of you when you're shaken up? When things don't go your way, what comes out? And that's just about you on your own. The bigger question is what about us together? What are we full of? As a congregation, what is into one full of? People think about the name of our church. They run into you and they find out where you go to church. What comes to their minds? Because as I said earlier, people and the church specifically, the church is most appealing when grace is most apparent. And one of the reasons that you might very well invite people to church, maybe even to our Christmas Eve service on Tuesday at 5, you'll get some pushback. The pushback that you get will have nothing to do with what they read in the Gospels about Jesus. I guarantee you. It is far more to do with other Christians that they've met and other church experiences that they just don't want to repeat. But here's what we've learned together. Here's what we aspire to. The church is always more appealing when grace is most apparent. And we are the church. Every single place that we go, everyone, everywhere, all the time. So what about you? Are you ready to remove a plank? Are you willing to remove a plank so that you can see clearly in order to benefit and to give grace to the people around you? People you sure are the ones that have the plank. And you're sure that you've got the speck of size. Would you be willing to consider that perhaps you have a plank that needs to be removed? A plank that is keeping you from extending grace to someone in your life. And honestly, this is no exaggeration. Grace from you could change their life. Grace from you would be an introduction to the grace of God. And grace from you because they know they don't deserve it. Because they are so aware already of what they've done. It could change their life. For some of you, this is probably even your story. It was the grace that you received from someone that you hurt deeply that ultimately opened you up to the truth of Jesus. And perhaps that's, perhaps that's why you're back in church or Maybe that's why you're listening, you're watching today. I bet you got your stuff ready for Christmas, or at least mostly. Your lights, all the lights that are going up are up. I bet your tree is up and that your gifts are wrapped. I bet your baking is baked. Your house is ready for Christmas. Your yard is ready for Christmas. Why are you ready for grace to come to town? Are you ready for grace to come into your home? Are you ready for grace to immerse and to envelop the people that you are going to be around? Are you ready for Christmas? And taking that plank out of your eye, recognizing that it's going to be difficult for you to recognize, acknowledging the thing that none of us wants to have to acknowledge about ourselves, doing that is the best preparation for a season characterized by grace. 
Here's the thing. Here's your check, your test that you can give yourself. If you feel superior to sinners like you, you still have some work to do. I think Jesus would say, hey, you know what, as you're going to celebrate my birthday, as you celebrate what God did on your behalf during this Christmas season, take some time to reflect and remove the plank from your own eye. Because grace really is, relationally speaking, the unexpected gift that is so unsettling and yet so transformative. And Jesus was full of grace and truth. He extended to people who were nothing like him. And then he asked people like us who are nothing like him to extend it to people who are nothing like us and who may not even like us. So let's do that. This Christmas season, let's do something unexpected. Let's do something unsettling. Let's be unsettling. Let's give to someone exactly what they don't expect and what they don't necessarily deserve. And when you do this, you will be like your Father in heaven. You will be part of the unexpected gift that's changing the world. Part of the unsettling solution. You will be amazing. Amazing. Just like this. Kind Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your foresight. Thank you for loving me, for loving us when we have worked seemingly so hard at being unlovable. Give us the opportunity to see ourselves clearly today as you see us in need of grace and recipients of grace at the same time. God, help me, help us to remember to show grace when we don't want to. When it's so clear that they don't deserve my grace, when they didn't earn it, and they keep doing things that don't earn it. Teach me how to reflect like you. Teach me how to give people who don't deserve grace, exactly what they don't deserve. Just like you gave me exactly what I didn't deserve and I did not earn. And let us enjoy our Christmas season by not seeing so clearly what everyone else needs to face. Give us the grace to trust you to change us and as we focus on our place, to trust you in that development, that we will be able to simply give grace to those around us. Encourage them for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming, for living, for displaying a way of life that is so completely other and so completely foreign that every time we think about it and look at it against our world, we want to argue against what it really actually happens. It doesn't seem to make sense. I don't think things can really work out that way. The fact that we are here argues differently. Your followers, when they decide to love first, to offer grace first, we allow that to transform our relationships, to oil our relationships so that we don't have to be so upset. We don't have to be so offended. We are free to live lives of grace and love. Holy Spirit, come. Live inside me. Live inside my friends that are here today. Keep your, keep your work up, please. We're not done. But we do want to move forward. Help us with that. Give us that gift this season, I pray. Make me more like Jesus.